So, take two. Um, we, this is podcast 10, uh, I believe. So, we're going to try something different for this one. So, we've had issues with audio and stuff in the past. So, we thought we'd make more technical. Thank you. The owners of Fairweather Tree. So, they created the Fairweather Modulus tab and the new Bearbo tab. Uh, Nikki was a member of the AA High Performance Squad in the past and is also a multiple national record holder in Bearbo Recurve. Having shot Bearbo for how long now? <laughs> <laughs> little while, <laughs> little while, um, and then we have um, Simon Fairweather, who's five-time Olympian, Olympic gold medalist, world target champion, a number of other things. But there's only so much room on the page. Um, <laughs> so what we might start off with um, is a few questions for Simon and Nikki, um, and we'll take viewer questions as well as we go along too. So just comment those below. Um, Nathan, do you want to start off on the questions? Sure. Um, so just for my question for me was sort of how, how have you seen the competition change, um, over the years from when you first started Simon to see nowadays you're back competing again? Um, have we gotten better as a nation? Is there ways that we can like keep pushing people to higher levels and that sort of stuff? You mean within Australia? Yeah, within Australia. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's progressed that much. Um, you know, like, archery is a funny sport in terms of, uh, you know, in some ways things don't change, in other ways they do. I mean, it's a bit of a cryptic statement, I guess, but, you know, like, we had a, a period before the uh, Sydney Olympics where we had a very comprehensive national program um, and, a, and a national training squad that trained, you know, six days a week. Um, and, uh, you know, the... the performance of that group was pretty good at the time um, and then you know things sort of slid a bit after that as, as funding ebbed away and, and uh, I guess the agendas were different for the, the national program you know they went to junior development focus and things like that so it sort of ends up being a bit of a cyclical process I think you know where, where performance comes and disappears again and um, you know there's sort of a feeling of everybody sort of having a lot of momentum or losing 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 that momentum, I guess. But internationally I think the performance has def definitely risen. You know, um, so I think uh, um, you know it's it's a real challenge for us here in Australia to keep up with that international standard. Uh, especially with always that challenge of, of being removed from easy access to competition. If you're not shooting competitions regularly, it's very difficult to maintain a competitive standard. And, you know, it's very expensive to do that from here. You know, you're either basing yourself overseas, which is expensive, um, or travelling back and forwards, which is also um, very expensive. So I don't know what the solution is there. I think it's just a, a burden we have to bear being so far from, from everyone else. Okay, so you think... What sort of ways do you reckon we could? Is it is it more funding that sort of thing, or different programs, well, mentors? Yeah, I think funding certainly makes it easier because then if you choose to compete uh, regularly overseas, you're able to do it. You know, like, there's really no way that anybody can self fund uh, that level of, of uh, a campaign and also train. You know, you, you can't earn money and train um, at the same time. Uh, if you're training at, at the level you need to be training at to be competitive uh, in today's um, circuit. So you're really relying on funding from other sources, whether it be um, the sport itself or sports commission or sponsors, you know, whichever um, source you, you, you look at, it's not going to come from the athlete. Okay. Um, and going back to more Australia focus, sort of your inspiration behind the the bear bow tab that you've just released. Um, you talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, as soon as we, as soon as I made that first um, uh, recurve tab, I had uh, some of our local bear bowers saying, "You know, are you going to make a three finger under version of this?" Um, and I guess there's been requests for that ever since. So it took a long time for us to come up with a design we were happy with. You know, we didn't just want to make a, a tab that we put our logo on and said, there you go, it's a, it's a bare tab. 
Our, our ethos was that the, the that our products need to be an elegant solution uh, to the problem, um, one that is um, simple and file safe, but comfortable and works. You know, so it took quite a while to come up with a design that we were happy with, and so and then even longer to, to you know, bring it to market in terms of getting the, the manufacturing of it done. Um, you know, we had to outsource some of it, um, and um, you know, then you know, being small companies as archery companies tend to be, and when certainly a small one, um, you don't have a lot of uh, um, clout, I guess, with industry you know, outside of the sport, or outside of the, the, the archery arena. So, um, you know, getting your product through um, through a, a um, you know, a, a tool shop to, to make tools and, and then to, to a company that, that does the production is, you know, you have to wait for other, other um, just <laughs> interloper here. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Cat's interrupting. Yeah. Back all around the world at the yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm just going to shift for one second. We're apparently having some audio issues. Do you want me to take over? <laughs> that I'm trying to fix. Um, that's really difficult to fix when I'm holding this. Um, we that, <laughs> tried that. Nathan, do you want me to talk? Um, yes, please. Is anyone? Can you hear that, Alec, and uh, on your stream? Yeah, I could hear it in the background. Um, yeah, I could hear it in the background. Um, no, there's no, there's no audio coming through on your live stream. I've got it all, I've got it all recorded. It's getting worse. Do you want to turn off the live stream? I've got it all recorded on any, on GarageBand anyway, so we'll just do it as a podcast. I've got it all recorded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No problem. Cool. So do you want me to go or are you going to keep going? Um, if I just bring up my other questions, I can actually yeah. keep going. All right. Uh, it's all gone now. We can't. We don't have any audio. Um, uh, so yeah, first question to Brian is, um, you know, wonder if you can tell us some information, uh, sort of your the Great Britain development programs and sort of your experience with those and how you've gone through that. Um, okay, so back when I started as a junior, um, it was a very different program to what it is now. Um, we only had a a junior Olympic development squad, which was essentially anybody that was either on the junior team or about to make the junior team. Um, and then we had the senior Olympic squad. Um, so I got on and involved in, in the system that way. So I made, made the junior squad back in 2010, uh, shot my first international in 2012. Um, and after that, after London, I was put onto the senior squad, and that's when things started to change. Um, I think now we have a, an academy system that you're sort of you go through. You're put into age groups. Um, you work with one of the the national age group coaches, um, which is all a lot more uh, remote. So you'll be given a program and stuff, and you you might only meet once a month um at the training center to sort of make sure that you're heading in the right direction make sure you're actually following the program and that everything's going well uh then you'd go on to the confirmation squad i think it's called um and that is now tends to be the junior team plus people that are are going to be the next lot of seniors um and then we have Olympic Ambition Squad, which is those that are expected to be at the next Games, and then Olympic Squad, which is our top squad at the moment, that everybody that's qualified for Tokyo. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's how it, it works at the moment. The, most of the Olympic Squad will train full-time at Lillishaw, our training centre. Um, there are a couple of us that aren't, but yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, and then, what uh, do you have any any rivalries with uh, other female recurvers on the international circuit? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, no. No. What about 
on the flip side, <laughs> any archers that you really get along with, so you know that you frequently find yourself sort of interacting with at international events. Uh, I don't know. I think we get on quite well with the German women um, and the American women as well. I think I think that's probably it for consistency. Like it just depends who you're on a target with, who you, who you're around, who who speak English. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, and then uh, post post coronavirus, what sort of what's the next big tournament you're looking forward to? Uh, at the moment, I'm holding out hope for the World Field Championships. Obviously, we don't know if they're going to go ahead. Um, but yeah, if if not that, then I'd love to get some of the Indoor World Series done this year. Yeah, cool. Uh, Alec, you saying? Um, oh, I was just going to say back to the question before. Um, you guys have a lot of training camps in Turkey, don't you? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's kind of your go-to, isn't uh, it? Yeah, so we go probably a couple of times a year, um, and we do train alongside the Turkish. And there is some some interaction there, but I think the last couple of times we've gone, it's ended up being they follow their program and we follow our programs. So we don't actually do an awful lot together. There'll be a few days where we do some scoring and and team rounds and stuff, but not not as much as you'd expect from sort of spending two weeks in the same place. Awesome. Um, Alec, do you uh, pass on to you? Um, I'm out of questions for the moment. Yeah, you're right. Um, all right, so back to you, Simon and Nikki. Question for Nikki. Um, transitioning from recurve to Bebo, um, what's the hardest thing besides flinching? <laughs> I think coming to the fact that you flinch often is probably the hardest thing that I've found. Um, it, it was tricky for me um, finding an anchor point, so it did take me a good few weeks of shooting with the bare bow to figure out something that felt comfortable and sort of natural and repeatable. Um, and that was just, you know, like it's such a different thing, having your, your hands up on your face if you've never done it before, which I hadn't. Um, but I think that, yeah, probably not having the clicker is the hardest thing that I have found to get used to. Um, and, yeah, and that I flinch all the time, <laughs> like really badly. Um, but it, it's been really fun, actually. I think, um, you know, like I, I I stopped shooting for a while after the World Field in Ireland um, because of that injury that I had um, and had sort of struggled every time I tried to come back to shooting with the injury sort of flaring up again, but it seems to that the, the higher anchor point with Bebo is making it so that that's not a thing anymore. So I've had no problems with it at all so far. So um, touch wood, um, that will continue because <laughs> it's nice to be able to shoot again. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, as you say, the flinching is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Did you um? Did you drop bow weight between recurve to bare bow? Hey, sorry. Did you drop draw weight between recurve to bare bow? Uh, well, yeah. So when I was shooting recurve before the injury, I think I forty one ish pounds. Hmm. Um, and I'm only shooting about thirty one, thirty two with the bare bow at the moment. Just a little bit to do with the fact that I just haven't been shooting, and so um, I think I could probably happily shoot a bit heavier, but. It's also meaning that I'm not having to, you know, like if I miss a few days here or there, it makes no difference at all. So mm. I'm kind of enjoying that part of it at the moment too. So um, it's been like really nice to just be able to manage the weight of the bow. Um, you know, for bare bow, the trick that we've um, been trying to have um, our aiming point at point on at 50 so that you've got your um, your crawl set just under the knock at 50 metres with the um, – the tip of the arrow pointing in the gold mm. and I'm set up with that with the 31 pounds so you know aside from it'd be really difficult to shoot it in windy conditions for everything else it's actually working quite okay as it is with the low pound. Yeah I think everyone that's um, spoken about Bebo kind of describes it as a lot more relaxed I mean the higher 
you know, the higher levels with any of the bow types is super competitive, but it seems to be, you know, it's not like the recurve, got to shoot 200, 300 arrows a day, every day, do all that intense training. Like it seems like a lot more relaxed way of doing it, I guess. It is pretty relaxed. Like we sort of um, wondered a little bit about how long that will be the case for now that it's being introduced as a, you know, sort of a bit more legitimate being recognised by world archery, whether there'll be more and more people that are making the change and seeing an opportunity to get in early and be the first group of people that are actually doing some serious training. Um, but I think that there's a fair bit of room for results to be going up as well in bare bow. Mm. Like the a pretty good big gap between the top performers and everybody and you know it doesn't take too many people for that top end to start getting a little bit tighter and a few more people compete yeah and especially i guess be being a world target thing as well that might pave the way for more funding to kind of be pushed in that direction too which might see more yeah. results yeah i think so i think it'll be interesting to watch over the next few years mm. okay um, also going back to fair weather archery, um, so you've just come out with your bare bow tab. Do you have plans for more products in the future? <laughs> Scary thought. Mm, yeah, not at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enjoying a bit of downtime um, at the moment with, uh, nothing, nothing, uh, you know, sort of imminent on the, on the drawing board. It really has been quite a job to get, uh, you know, those products out, you know, like it just seems, seems like such a simple little product, but, um, you know, just pulling it all together is like such a huge job. And of course it's just the two of us. So, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, you've got a marketing guy doing that and, a, you know, a, you know, a merchandise person doing that and someone else doing the website and everything. It's all of us, you know, it's mostly Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's been, you know, a really big job just getting what we, what we do uh, up and running. We, we do have, um, few plans to sort of streamline the production going forward. You know, we've got a, a couple of new machines um, that should make things a bit easier for us. Um, but um, so we've got to work on those. But yeah, nothing new at the moment. We don't really want to make products just for the sake of making them either. We mm -hmm. really only wanted to um, bring out things as good ideas occur to us rather than, you know, someone saying, oh, why don't you put an arm guard in your product and then in this and, and just coming up with some arm guard to put our logo on and saying, okay, there it is. There's no point, you know, there's good arm guards on the market. I don't have problems with any of the ones that I'm, you know, that I've used in the past. Whereas with the tabs, the, the whole point of the, the modulus tab was that I didn't like any of the tabs, you know, I wanted something that solved those issues. Um, and I feel like the bare bow tab is similar to that same ethos. It, it solves some of the issues uh, that bare bow tabs have. Um, and uh, and I think it did it uh, well, you know. So to to make something else just for the sake of it, uh, I don't think there's much point in that. So so until something starts to uh, annoy me in the rest of the year, and I I can see a way of doing it better, then uh, we'll stick with what we've got at the moment. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well the um, design aside, but just the actual leather as well of the tabs we've had. Um, I know at the shop we've had quite a few people who've bought the Fairweather tabs and then we have an older um, tab with Cordovan on it. Um, and a couple of times when people have bought a tab, we run them both under the water and have say have a shot with each and they look down and they go, oh, like straight away it's a very noticeable thing. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how long before kangaroo leather kind of becomes the norm, I guess, because it's just kind of proven itself now. Yeah, I mean, I think our perspective on it is that it's, it's perhaps a bit more of a consumable uh, item than cordovan. Um, you know, cordovan can last and last and last, but the downside is it takes so long to get it prepared. So, so then once you've been using it for a long time, you're too scared to change it because you know it's going to take a long time to get the new one to a point where you're happy with it. Whereas the kangaroo, you know, it's almost instantly ready. It doesn't last quite as long as cordovan, but it means that you can constantly have good fresh tabs um, that you're using that are at peak um, performance straight away. Mm. So it's a bit like race tires on a car, you know, you're not looking for extra kilometres in them, you want peak performance out of them right now. Um, and that's how we see the, the kangaroo. And, you know, really, we're, both of the two tabs are really uh, geared towards competition shooting, you know, you know getting good performance. Uh, and um, 
we felt that uh, you know that the, the kangaroo was a no-brainer on that front. That you know you're looking for good, consistent, top performance straight away with it. Mm-hmm. And then um, it ruined in them. Yeah, and it, it survives <laughs> getting wet very well too. So you get yeah. caught in competition. Um, uh, tabs get wet, and they, you know that normally with caught them, they're never the same again. You know, you can shoot them, but they don't feel the same as they did before they got wet. Whereas the kangaroo seems to survive being well and truly soaked. I mean, it does suffer being wet. You know, it's not like you can shoot it dripping wet and and it not be affected by it. But when it dries out, it goes back to how it was more or less. Whereas a quarter of them never does. Yeah. In my experience, anyway. Yeah. No, I've, I've found. Yeah, I found the same thing. We've had a lot of people that would um, come in and buy like a starting recurve, so they might spend. Three hundred, four hundred dollars on their first full recurve setup, and then we're showing them finger tabs, and you've got your five dollar piece of leather, you've got a thirty dollar tab, and a fair with a tab, and I'd say probably seventy percent of the time they'll go for the fair with one, and that's them spending you know a few hundred dollars for their first setup of the bow and everything. Um, so yeah, that's certainly something we've found at the shop as well. Um, the, the, the easiest way, the easiest way for me to do it when I'm selling it is I just grab my tab. I just say have a feel of that, um, and you know they never want to, you know, never want to put it down, sort yeah. of thing. They're very, uh, very easy things to sell for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's great to hear from that point of view. Um, um, no, actually, trying those old tabs after you've shot one for a while, and, and having like a hard spacer or something else that's sort of like rigid and doesn't feel like it fits your hand well, it's always that kind of like you feeling like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so a couple of questions for Bryony as well. Um, so before, obviously, all this stuff happened and training and stuff has kind of been put on hold, what would a typical training day look like for you in the last couple of years? Um, so I'll always do my gym sessions in the morning. So just get up, breakfast, and then straight to the gym. Um, probably spend hour, hour and a half in the gym. That will be a strength session and probably some cardio as well uh, and then shooting would be depending on the point in the season it could be between two to four hundred arrows a day um, and how long that takes depends if I'm shooting blank boss or um, or 70 meters where I've been at university most of what I've had to do especially over the winter has just been blank boss so the last couple of months before coronavirus um i could have been to the gym shot 400 hours and done my lectures for the day and that would be me done by 3 p.m so it's yeah it, it really depended on on that and then also what i had uni wise on on those days as well but yeah typically two to four hundred hours whenever it fits gym in the morning and then yeah rest of the day just chilling or doing work <laughs> So would you actually give yourself, um, like say you had a training plan for a week or a month, do you have scheduled times where you would actually not shoot or not do anything, like rest days or that kind of thing? Uh, Yes. When I was doing my own program a couple of years ago, I was only having one rest day a week. Um, And that was more just for, I think, my own confidence. Because if I knew that I was shooting six days a week, then I was happy that I was doing enough. Um, since last January, we've had a new guy, Alberto, come in and he writes all of our programs for us. Um, some weeks I could be having two rest days. Some days I s- still just have the one. Um, so it took a bit of getting used to to, uh, to sort of have the, the trust and the confidence in that. And that it was okay because I was doing enough every other day. Um, but yeah, so, so definitely one rest day a week, but sometimes two. Ronnie, do the, the off days have any recovery work as well, like massage or, you know, um, plunge pools or anything like that, or are you just purely resting? No, just purely resting. Uh, the only time we ever really get anything, like any massages or anything like that is if there is an issue and then it's normally just see the physio and see what's what's needed but if you're healthy and and fit then you know just yeah just rest 
Um, and with you were to set up a brand new bow from scratch, simplified, because um, we have a lot of questions about tuning. Um, what's your ballpark kind of tuning setup on a new bow? Like what are the steps you'd take to get it set up to kind of being 90, 95% of the way that you're happy with it? Okay. Uh, so first thing would be to get the limbs straight. Uh, yeah, check. Check the limbs are straight. Then I would set the draw weight to whatever the bow I had been shooting was on. I'd get them as close as, as possible. Uh, check the tiller, brace height and centre shot. And then pretty much as soon as that's done, I'd shoot maybe a couple of hundred arrows blank boss with it. And then I would check it again, make sure nothing's moved. Then I would go to 30 metres and I would bear shaft tune at 30 metres. So the first thing that I'd move, if anything needed moving, would be the knocking point. Um, once I'd set that, then I would have a look at the left to right and see if the button pressure needed changing. Uh, for me, depending on what bow I've shot, i found that the bear shaft, the groups... The fletch groups shoot better depending like different positions of the bear shaft. So with the old hoists like the HPX, I always found that my groups were better when the bear shaft was slightly weak. Um, but with the newer risers, I found the opposite, and I actually shoot with my bear shaft slightly stiff. Um, so I would get that to the position that I was happy with at thirty. Uh, more so if I was setting a bow up for field, but I still do it with target as well. I would then do a walk back test just to make sure that that everything was was all set up correctly. Uh, and then I would just do my fine tuning at 70 metres. Um, yeah, just play around with the button a little bit, um, check group sizes, make sure there was nothing odd about anything on the bow or any particular arrows. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, because we've had quite a few, quite a few of the questions kind of revolve around tuning. Um, maybe if we kind of all say um, our like, doesn't have to be process, but kind of views on tuning. So Simon and Nikki, what would you kind of, what would either be your process or what are your views on kind of tuning a recurve? Uh, shooting recurve, um, like Olympic recurve. Pretty much what Brian has suggested. Um, for the, for instance, the Sydney Olympics, the only tuning that my bow got for that was just bare shaft at 30 metres. Um, I didn't do an extensive um, tune on that. You know, I didn't I certainly didn't do bare shaft at 70 metres or anything like that. I just wanted it to be, uh, you know, the bare shafts were in the group uh, with that bow. Um, I did do a bit of time testing arrows. Uh, spent a bit of time just before the games when we got our last uh, allocation of arrows from the program. We, uh, I think, we had maybe three dozen arrows each, um, new new arrows, and I shot all three dozen as one big group uh, bare shaft. Um, seeing as the bare shaft were going in the group anyway, I shot the whole lot um, over and over and discarded. The arrows that weren't going in the group for whatever reason um, and it worked out to be about 50 50 so I split them into two groups uh, the ones that weren't going in the group became the practice arrows and the ones that all landed in the group were my competition ones um, and that's really all I did uh, for that you know I really think that as long as the bow is basically sound uh, it comes down to how you shoot it so do you think you'd find a very noticeable difference. So when when you did that test, they were all bare shafts, were they? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you think once they were fletched, you'd see a very noticeable difference between the two sets of I arrows? Fletchers do iron a lot of it out, I think. Mm. Um, so really, it was just looking for any that might have had any little, you know, stiffness or uh, weakness issues, um, and, and maybe that they didn't even really need to, you know. Be sorted in that way. That was just the process I did, and, and, and you know, it worked on, on the at the event. Um, you know, I, I think that the quality control of, of the arrows is pretty good. I mean, obviously, we were shooting X tens um, then. Um, you know, it's pretty rare from a new set of arrows that you find ones that are not right. Um, they do wear out, 
you know, arrows wear out. So I think as time goes past, you start to see more things popping up, um, particularly if you're shooting arrows underspined a bit. You know, they, they, they break down then. Um, but, you know, if they all weigh the same and, and uh, their spine around the shaft is, is good, um, a stiff side and a weak side, which is pretty rare in a, a set of new arrows, but, you know, as long as you make sure that's not an issue, then, um, you know, they're pretty good. So staying on the topic of equipment, um, someone asked when's the right time to upgrade their equipment. Um, I guess this is for everyone, um, but what would you, I guess, feel the main differences between a starting bow versus a top of the range bow and when's the right time for someone actually to make that transition? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, everybody always wants to uh, upgrade as soon as they can afford to. Um, you know, I, I think a really basic beginner bow, um, they're serviceable, but you don't get a high performance out of them, I think, whereas the mid-range bows are pretty good. You know, so the very, very basic ones are just that. Once you start getting into... Um, sort of the second string bows of, you know, like one down, one down from the top level for each manufacturer. They're pretty good and, you know, if you can shoot well, they'll, they'll perform, in my view. Um, the big, uh, I guess the, the, the issue in terms of when, uh, for people who are further down the track, is everybody always seems to end up with a new bow just before an event, which seems to be the worst habit, you know. <laughs> Because you get used to you get used to a bow, you know, and, and uh, your reaction time sort of become gets in sync with the bow, the way it works, you know. Particularly limbs, um, you know, if you for some reason change limbs only a few months out from a big event, sometimes they don't work for you. You know, you, there's no reason why they shouldn't, but you just never really meld with the bow, um, or at least not for a long time, and the, the events come and gone. So. You know, I, I guess perhaps it's not quite answering the question, but I'd always um, hesitate changing changing bows uh, before and better to do it when you get back and um, you know do that as part of your preparation for the next event after. Assuming you're competing, that is. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on that, Bryony? Um, I think it depends on. The, the technique as well and the, the consistency and your, your ability to be consistent with your technique because that's going to make more of a difference to to how somebody's shooting than a new bow. Um, and yeah, like, like Simon said, you can do a lot with a mid-range bow as long as you're, as long as you're consistent, as long as you're, you've got a good technique. So that would be the first thing before you even consider changing anything else, is it like have have I got a consistent technique? Could I make it better by doing anything slightly different here before I then think, okay, I've done everything I can. Maybe there is a few more points to be gained by upgrading something. Yeah, you know, there was that um, uh, the thing that Chef Vandenberg did with uh, T4, T4, T4 Plus oh, yeah. that he pulled out of his collection. And shot that at a, at a, I think it was a um, local club round, round, I think. Yeah, yeah, like a fourteen forty round, something like that. And he shot nearly as well with that as he did with you know, his current bow. You know, so it's it's how you shoot it, I think, that really counts. You know, people often ask, you know, do you think the gear has really allowed the scores to go up since since when I was, you know, in my heyday, and. I don't know if it's really made that much of a difference. I really think it's what that the way people train and their expectation and their knowledge uh, of how to shoot. I think that's that's what made the biggest difference. Um, you know, once if you've got a good set of arrows that are all working properly and the bows tuned properly and you've got good clearance and all that kind of thing, you know, I think it really comes down to you know what you're doing with it um, rather than uh, how how new it is and and uh, what it costs. Yeah, I think the technologies that they're doing with the upgrades at this point in time are sort of more at the pointy end of results, aren't they? Like, you know, they Fractions, gonna, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're going to put you from like a 695 to a 697 or something like that. Like yeah, A couple of points, yeah. maybe. You know. But not something that a, 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 us mere mortals would 
um, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so moving it's away. It's always nice. From... Like using new bows, of course. Yeah. You know, like we, all, we all like getting new stuff. <laughs> but uh, it really it probably doesn't make a big difference. I guess that's also the thing. It's like, so what's the people's motivations for getting a new gear? Is it because you like new gear and it's fun to tinker with and that's part of what you love about archery? That if you bought it, buy it today. Like, mm. you know, it's what you love about that you should be looking at, mm. at maintaining with it. So, yeah. You can afford it, and that's that's what you enjoy about archery. Then yeah, don't wait. Yeah, buy a new tab. It's um, it's an interesting thing to bring up though, because there are certainly people. I mean, there's always this underlying theme when people are kind of tinkering with their gear and changing stuff that people always say, you know, don't do that. Just focus on technique. Leave leave the gear alone, which is true to some extent. But there are a surprising number of people who are in archery that they like shooting, but I think they like playing with the gear and tinkering things and especially compounds because there's so much you can do on those. Um, and I've seen people like that in the past who've been told, you know, stop playing with the cam, stop adjusting things, you know, focus more on your training. And they just don't even train as much because they kind of lose their, their thing, their part of it that they really enjoy. So that's kind of an yeah. interesting aspect to it as well, I guess, just – where do you get your enjoyment of the sport from? Yeah, I mean, you see those people that buy the latest and greatest boat every single year, mm. like, and that just love love getting some new gear and what colour strings am I going to put on it and how am I going to make it look cool and what am I going to do to personalise it and stuff. You know, if that's what they love about it, then, yeah, go for it. I think it's great. Mm, mm. Whatever keeps people passionate about the sport, I think, is the important thing. But if you're buying equipment in the in, in the expectation that it's going to buy you points, I think that that's that's where you'll probably be a bit disappointed, generally speaking. <laughs> yeah, we get we get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, another question we got as well. Um, they said, "How do you get through the clicker?" But I guess that can also apply to Bebo. Um, so they said, how do you get through the clicker without disturbing the shot or collapsing? So I guess maybe if each of you kind of want to explain how, how you would actually expand, like what's your thought process when you're trying to get through that last, uh, last part of the shot? Uh, so um, I was always, oh, yeah, you're, you're up, Ronnie. You're up. <laughs> uh, well, I was always taught that like the clicker going off, it isn't the end of the shot. Um, you've got to keep going and keep that movement through expansion until the arrows hit the target um so i think having that in my mind all the time really helped because rather than the clicker being a signal to just let go it was all it was was just like a reminder that that's that's just me getting to the same point every shot rather than it being like okay now i go um and another thing is it I was told that like you shouldn't actively be listening for the click. It should just you like you almost feel it, and you just you just know that it's gone off. Um, so I've I've practiced a lot with headphones in, just trying to know when when the shots shots right and, and yeah. Just I always think when I'm at full draw, like just keep pulling, and I keep pulling until I've seen the arrow land on the target. Um, and I also. I spoke to Brady once because he did a video about how he shoots some rounds just without his clicker. Um, and I actually found that really interesting because he was saying that it's important that you don't let the clicker control you or your shot. The clicker is just a device to help you with your shot. So by shooting without it, you're rather than just seeing the gold and letting go. Um, and I guess this kind of applies like similar with Bearbo is that you're actually setting the shot up correctly and you're shooting it when it's ready to be shot rather than, oh, there's a the middle, I let go. And I think that's when you end up collapsing a bit more or the shot breaks down in some other way. I was just going to say, for me, it's sort of <clears throat> maintaining that even pressure between push and pull, sort of what I focus on. Um, but I go through different stages of, like, say if I'm doing something bad, I may focus on for a bit, but definitely don't do that because it can become worse. Um, but sort of uh, different things work well for me at different times, depending on sort of how I'm shooting, 
um, how I'm feeling, if I'm feeling comfortable or not. Yeah. I've, I've, yeah, I've done everything you can think of. What's Simon time working on today? Is yeah. that a question? <laughs> it's changed quite a yeah, bit from, from time to time. Um, I guess in in hindsight, what I'd say about all those different ways of using using the clicker, the key thing I think is that as Brian said, you maintain your connection with uh, you know, the muscles that were holding the bow back. The, 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 the connection, that the utilisation of those muscles doesn't change when you go to release the arrow. You know, you're dropping the string off of your fingers, but you're not letting all of that back tension, shoulder tension go at the same time. Um, so the only thing that should really change is that the string falls off your fingers. So it's sort of a bit like a release aid on a compound going off. Um, and in, in terms of bare bow, that's, that's the big... That's the difficult thing uh, with bare bow uh, is that, like uh, you know, if you're shooting like Brady shooting without the clicker, um, you've got to decide when you're going to let it go. You know, you haven't got that click as a sort of semi-removed decision. Um, you're faced with that uh, very real decision: when am I going to let this shot go? And um, that's what most people shooting bare bow. Um, and especially people who come from recurve and they've been used to using a clicker, uh, find is the biggest challenge, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, it, it's exacerbated too with a bare bow because you don't have the stabilizers to hold the front half relatively still if you do start to lose that connection and, and lose that tension. Um, so, you know, if you, if you lose uh, your, your expansion tension, if your, your drawing bow starts going forward because you're collapsing, your bow hand also tends to start moving back towards it and, and there's no mass in the bow or no, no stabiliser rods um, giving that, that sort of stationary inertia, um, holding the bow still for that little bit longer. So you get a double movement and, and that's why you get those huge mistakes you see from their bowers when they, when they do get the yips. So it's not like, you know, damn, I shot an eight, that's a terrible shot, it's, whoops, I missed the whole butt, uh, which is pretty when it happens, <laughs> but it's, it happens a lot. Um, the other one we got was more kind of <clears throat> mentally focused. Um, it's something that's probably talked about quite a lot in archery, saying how oh, it's 90% mental, 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 mental. I reckon 90% of the people that say that don't do anything to help that part. Um, is there anything that you guys do in particular, like before a comp or as part of your training that you've done in the past or you do now to try and mentally prepare yourself? Brian, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing for me is the enjoyment factor. Um, I always shoot in competition, no matter what level, I always shoot better if I'm happy with with shooting in general um, so it's before a competition I'll always make sure that I'm in the best place generally like not just archery specific so that I'm actually happy I'm enjoying training and that gives me more confidence as well and the other thing is being able to accept whatever preparation I've done for an event so where I'm at university as well, if I've not actually been able to put the time in, then how can I expect to be shooting big scores? So it's knowing, okay, well, this is what I've done. This is the sort of level I'm at. I'm just going to go, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to do, do as best I can. But as long as I finish the competition, the weekend, the, the week with a smile on my face, and I can say, you know what, I did everything I could and I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any shots back. I think that's one of the most important things for me. I think that, that potential for pressure from, from within is, is you know, uh, a big hurdle um, for, for us as, as athletes. Um, you know, depending on how you're viewing, as, as Brian said, if you're feeling happy about things and satisfied with where you're at and so on, it's much easier to feel relaxed about the, the probable outcome you're expecting. 
Um, whereas if you're going into an event fearing what the outcome is going to be because either you know you haven't done the work um, but you still want the result or there's so much gravity in that, that result. You know, it's the Olympics and you've trained for eight years for it or something like that and you're dreading a, a negative outcome. Um, you know, it, I think that becomes the biggest issue, you know, uh, what, what, what expectation you have and, and what your fears are uh, relative to those, those expectations. The other thing about um, you know, mental preparation is when I first started competing internationally, it seemed that the, the psychologists that I had anything to do with then were much bigger on giving athletes real uh, sort of skill tools to deal with um, the psychology of, of competing, um, doing things like um, self-relaxation and visualisation and things like that. It seemed to me that after that first few years of my involvement at that level that the psychology side of things from the psychologist's uh, perspective slid away from that kind of thing and talked more about, you know, how you're feeling, are you happy at home, you know, let's all just talk about, you know, um, feeling good about it. And and the, the, the skills or the, the tools seem to slide away from um, um, what was being offered. And I, I haven't seen it come back. And I, I missed that, I think. I, I felt that um, doing those things, those relaxation, uh, it's sort of almost semi-hypnosis type training. Um, it's an active thing, it's not a passive training, it's not like you're being hypnotised, you actually have to work at it, um, but it's in a relaxation state. Um, I felt that that gave me the most bang for buck in the whole time um, I competed in terms of uh, how I felt about machining, how quickly I improved, um, how well I managed bigger events. So I don't know why they don't do that anymore, um, but I think they should. <coughs> Um, for me, it's sort of thinking of every shoot as more experience. Um, sort of no matter what happens, you know, I'm, I'm learning um, how to compete better, how to work better in the situation. Because um, I, you know, only been shooting for about a year and went to Worlds and really, really, like the Worlds in Sydney and really fell apart. I'm like, uh, <laughs> it wasn't really good. So now, now every opportunity I'm getting, I'm just thinking next time I'll be better. Uh, and generally it works that way, so it's good. It's interesting where you yeah. talk about the tools and stuff as well. Like um, I've had kind of a mixed bag of experience <clears throat> with different psychologists and stuff, and the ones that have been the best are the ones that have been able to say, you know, like you said, oh, like there might be uh, CDs and stuff you listen to before you shoot, um, specific exercises and movements and stuff you do to get yourself into a certain place. I think those are very simple is probably the wrong word, but they're very confidence building because they're quick things you can do that likely a lot of your competition aren't doing. Um, yeah. And I think it's something that's definitely neglected and it's a relatively not easy, but it's a lot easier than going out and running 20 kilometers or spending two hours in the gym. So what that psychologist I first uh, dealt with used to do was, I saw him weekly and we would do a like a visualization session where he would talk me through it. But before we did it, we'd discuss what it was I'd been working on in training that week, what things I was trying was trying to improve in my technique and, and my thought process. And we'd address those things in that that um, relaxation visualization session. But he'd also record it. So I then got to use the cassette as it was. Uh, for the rest of the week before I saw him. So every day I redid that session on my own um, and, and, and was, you know, working mentally on the things I wanted to improve and then we'd, we'd uh, um, do another one the next week. And so I felt like, you know, the, the potential for improvement was much higher in that scenario than um, uh, just, you know, meandering along, shooting lots of arrows. And it was a simple thing, you know, it doesn't cost anything really. It's just a, you know, a talking through it and thinking about it and making a recording. So 
Um, I, I thought it was a great scenario. I think the problem at the moment for a lot of people, especially if they aren't involved in some kind of high performance program, is knowing where to look or where to start. Because mm. I know, like, especially from my own experience, it's even if you've got a psychologist and you're sort of told roughly what you should be doing, like a lot of the stuff that we've done is like, oh, you should have a, a routine and you should be thinking the same thing in every shot. And that works for some, but it doesn't work for everybody. But I think it's, yeah, it's quite interesting that you could do something as simple as as just listening to some kind of um, like relaxation CD or um, yeah, doing some basic visualization of your shot, and that could actually help quite significantly. Yeah, it was. I think um... it's simple, finding somebody appropriate for you. You know, there's a lot of. I mean, it's the same old thing, isn't it? Like. You know, people go to university and, and they pass with uh, you know, better than 50% results. So not every psychologist is the best psychologist, you know, and sometimes you deal with those people who, yes, they're a psychologist, but they're not really all that good at it. So <laughs> finding, finding a good one who works well with you is not always easy. I think that is finding somebody that works well with you because like Brian you were saying everybody functions differently there's going to be psychologists that have different viewpoints or different skill sets or things that are of interest or what they believe works and finding something that works for you in that sense yeah it's um I know I had a I had an audio clip that I was using through 2015 to 2016 and I made sure every single time before we had a competition I'd listen to it um and I tried using that again in 20, uh, late 2018, I think, at a comp. I wasn't shooting a whole lot. Um, and I had this weird thing where the first kind of dozen or three dozen arrows of the 720 was back to where I was before. And then um, reality kicked in and I started shaking and <laughs> realized that's not what I should be shooting. But it kind of demonstrated how powerful those kind of things can be because before my body caught up with me, um, I'd kind of put myself back in that mindset of when I was training and my scores just went straight back up there. Um, yeah, so it shows just how powerful that kind of stuff can be. Um, so the last question we've got from the ones we had on Instagram, someone asked, what was the lowest or hardest point for you in your archery so far? Tricky one. <laughs> Uh, certainly the lowest one for me was probably um, the 92 Olympics where I'd gone in as world champion and the Australian media had, um, as they tend to do, um, talked up my chances of being the Olympic champion and then uh, I lost the first round, which was uh, pretty pretty devastating and, uh, and I didn't really want to talk to the media straight away then because I was wanting to just go off and uh, lick my wounds and uh, I got got slammed for that. So that was a pretty pretty uh, uh, negative um, experience. And obviously the Sydney Olympics was probably the highlight for me. Brian? Uh, I think kind of too come to mind for me. So there was a period from the start of 2014 to about halfway through 2015. Um, and I'd got injured I had a really bad elbow injury and it just kind of completely threw my confidence and even once I'd sort of got over the worst of the injury I could shoot decent scores in practice and I just couldn't replicate it in competition and then every time I was competing then it it sort of became a thing where it was like well what's going to happen today is it going to go how it's gone in practice or is it just going to am I just going to mess it up again and it was, yeah, quite quite a long period to sort of every weekend I drag myself to a competition and not knowing, not knowing and not having any confidence in what was going to happen, and so that that was really tricky. But then also, I think missing out on the Rio Games was hard as well. But that was in in a completely different way because I'd sort of I'd picked myself back up. I'd been shooting really well that season, and saying that I was expecting to go as is wrong but it's you kind of like I knew I had every chance and I'd given myself every opportunity 
to to qualify that spot and to to make the team. So to miss out on that was was quite hard to deal with afterwards. You got anything there? My uh, yeah, my highest my highest and low points are all concerned around one one sort of break I took. Um, I took a month off and shot compound for a month. Um, and it took me three months to get back to sort of the level I was before that break on my recurve. Um, and I had a really, really bad spout of target panic where I, some days I just could barely even pull the bow back, shaking so much. Um, and then, you know, it took months and months to get over that, got some additional help, different coach point of view and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then the high point was when I finally got back to the level where I was before, um, I had a massive points jump where I smashed my PB. Um, and I was you know, really, really happy with that, um, that I was able to build back to where I was. It's an interesting um, part of it as well because you hear a lot of people kind of talking about persistence and, you know, oh, the scores aren't quite where they should be and, you know, keep working at it and stuff like that. And a lot of people certainly have very different views on what's considered, you know, giving it a good crack and how long should I be kind of working at it. Um, I know for me, 2000 and so I started in 2008 to 2011. Um, those were the golden years because I was young and had no idea what was going on. Um, and then 2011 to 2015, I had five or six internationals of going and losing first round every single time. Um, and it's an interesting kind of thing when people like talk about motivation, um, how sometimes it just takes a long time (laughs) for it to come together. Um, and it's interesting as well. Uh, I know Simon, a lot of people probably don't realize you know, the gap that you had between winning the world champs in 91 to then winning the Olympics nine years later. Um, yeah. Did you want to talk any, any more about that? Cause I mean, that pretty much is the height of persistence, I think to be at that level for so long. Yeah. Well, it was a grind. Um, I guess, uh, I guess the, the win in 91 perhaps came a little earlier than I expected. I was, you know, like everyone hopeful of getting a, a a good result at some point in my career, um, but um, you know I, I made my first national team in late '87, and then by '91, you know, had won the world championships. And really, I perhaps it would have been better if it had been a few more years before I got that result, um, because then I, I was suddenly faced with having to deal with um, the expectation, both from myself and from other people, that I would continue on at that level. Um, and then uh, probably had the um, 92 Olympics where, I, as I said before, I fell on my face pretty badly. And, um, and I've been shooting well going into that too, so I was feeling pretty optimistic about how I would go. So that was when they first brought in the matches too. So the big hurdle then was going from a grand feeder round um, in 91 where I won to the very next year where they went to matches and, and changing that whole headspace of, how you how you uh, have to comp- or how, how you have to attack the the, the, uh, the round how you train for it how you think within it um, was completely different you know and, and uh, I guess you know people who have grown up with with matches now that's all they've ever known you know so um, I can tell you that all the guys who shot other rounds before the matches came along all really struggled with it um, to get their heads around it. And I just kept having that thing where I'd shoot well in training and then go away to the events and, and lose first round because I got really nervous. And I'd never really been nervous before that, um, even at nationals or international events. Never really felt nervous. But the first um, match event I shot, I think it was at, uh, in, in Arizona, one of the Arizona Cups, and they had matches there. And I couldn't believe how nervous I suddenly felt, you know. Match started and bang, there I was feeling terrible, and uh, and that that plagued me for years, um, and I still get nervous um, even even now, um, and I don't really mind what the results are, and yet it still kicks in. I still get really nervous, um, so yeah, that that was a it felt like a long nine years. Um, doesn't seem like such a long period now looking back back at it, but at, at the time it felt like forever. Speaking about the matches, Bryony, I'm really curious, in the UK, is it commonplace that people shoot like a 720 round and then match play afterwards, or is it 
like so I mean in Australia there's some match play but more often than not like at club level people aren't really exposed to it so we don't do it a little bit here just curious if it's the same over there or if it's commonplace um all of our national series stuff is uh pretty, yeah pretty much all of that's a 720 and then match play and that's that could be six or seven competitions um and and would do that both on a saturday and a sunday so if you're competing at that level then yes you do get quite a lot and there are yeah there are a lot of opportunities to to experience that but the yeah at club level you don't really get a chance we have a lot of random rounds like traditional rounds in the uk um well, yeah we'll shoot in yards and and that's more of what the what club archers are, are exposed to and even sort of like a, a county or a regional championships would more likely be a, a 1440 at the moment than it would be a, a 720 so yeah until until you make that jump from like a regional level to a, a national level competition you yeah and you wouldn't really practice matches either if you've not well yeah until you actually do them in a competition so that sounds similar, I guess. Just we can't really drive to our national events. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can. It just takes a very long time. Yeah. Well, Alec, me, well, Alec has a lot of Qantas points. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you got anything else, Nathan? Uh, just one more question to Simon. Uh, what's Alec like as a student? <laughs> Because uh, he, uh, yeah, he's the coach of Eliza, you know, the highest coach at Eliza, but we want to know how the boss learns. As a student, I really like Alec. Uh, he, um, he thinks about what he's doing and he thinks about what he's asking. Um, and you know, that's the kind of uh, athlete-coach relationship I, I prefer, you know, where it's really just a collaboration, you know. Uh, the athlete uh, may or may not come up with the question or it might be... Um, coach offering something but there's a discussion and uh, um, an evaluation and some learning and rather than just the dictatorial situation where the coach says I think you need to do this and the athlete goes off and does it um, I, I think there, there's ownership from the athlete that needs to be done um, both in terms of facilitating the learning but also then achieving the result you know um, so so I, I think Alex a really good student in that sense and uh, I like working with him. Very good. Thank you. Um, we might pre-check the questions next time, Nathan, before we pop them in there. Uh, I might pre-brief those. 